Welcome back, everyone, here to Bronx Talks. We got a very special guest with us. Uh, first off, Christian, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Going to let you introduce the guest right away. And Derek from NYY Recaps, how are you doing today? I'm a little bored, man. This uh, this off season's kind of slow. Yeah, yeah definitely, 100%. definitely. I remember uh, last year I was a big fan of your recaps after the games. Uh, I watched almost all of them, and it's just crazy to think now that uh, I'm on a pod, uh, podcast with you. It's just uh, really exciting. So it's going to be yeah. a fun episode, man. I appreciate the grind, man. It's fun. Everybody's podcasting these days. There's always lots of room in the tent for new visions, new ages, new insights. So good luck with it. We appreciate right, that. Yeah. Well, let's get right into it, shall we? So okay. right now we start off the state of the Yankees. Yankees are kind of just sitting there, not really doing anything, kind of staying quiet uh, while other teams are making – Big moves. I wouldn't say they have run out of time to, you know, make the moves they want to. Um, certainly, players have come off the board too. And one thing that stuck out to me: they're not like even the rumors uh, that we're hearing. They're not like totally in on everyone. There's like a little things like, oh, they're somewhat interested in like you know story or something like that. But it, basically, everything is quiet. So, what, what's your take on that? Well, I've heard that before, and, and a lot of it is gamesmanship between the GM and the team and the agents. You never really know who's in on who. The Yankees have their private meetings. It happens in Tampa at the end of every season, and they talk about their game plan for the winter. Who are we targeting? How are we going to approach the deals? You know, What's our max offer? What's our budget for the season? And the Yankees put together sort of like a flow chart for who's available, who's not. They met with Seager, obviously, to check in. I think they liked Seager, but I don't think they saw Seager as a $300 million player. I didn't either. I do think that they're probably, you know, if they're in on uh, Carlos Correa, you know, I, I would always think that that would be the final move because he's the best player of all of the shortstops that were available. He's going to command the most money. So if, if he was the Yankees guy, they probably waited and said, all right, let's see what happens with Seager, and now let's talk to Correa. That, that would be my guess. Uh, I, I think they're trying to improve uh, in any way they can, but they're also not going to just make moves just to make moves. So, you know, as our good friend John Boy said uh, in their episode tonight, you know, we're on the journey still. Let's not get, you know, too uh, – too far ahead of ourselves with getting mad at Cashman and and uh, mad at uh, Steinbrenner and saying people are cheap when we really don't know the whole picture. They might have a blockbuster trade waiting to happen as soon as you know some more dominoes fall. So my take is let's be patient. Let's not assume that you know the Yankees are in on everybody. Let's assume they have their targets. They know they need to improve. If it gets to be spring training and, you know, we're running the same team back out there with maybe Andrelton Simmons and uh, Anthony Rizzo, I, I could see the Yankee and Brett Gardner. I could see the Yankees fans at that point having the right to be a little bit perturbed. <laughs> I, uh, I agree with that. However, obviously you still have Story and Correa who are they're still an option. However, the stopgap seems like it's becoming a lot more likely. There was talks with the guy uh, from the Rangers, Iser, Kiner, Falifa. Obviously, you have Simmons. You know, there's some other guys floating around. My question to you is, if they go with the stopgap, how else can they improve and become really what we wanted them to do? Because a lot of guys are off the board now. Right, well, let's think back to Moneyball, right, where they said, well, we can't replace Giambi. You know, you, you can't replace Carlos Correa with any of the stopgap options you're not going to get, you know, a seven war shortstop off of, you know, the waiver wire. You know, so uh, Kiner Falefa, I think, is more of a Tyler Wade replacement on the roster or a Rugnet Odor replacement on the roster if they choose to go that route. Because he's a guy he can catch. He can play third base. He can play the infield. He's a defensive whiz. He doesn't hit much, but he's a defensive whiz. But if they just decide, let's say, you know, we're going to run it with, you know, Oswaldo Cabrera or 
We're going to go with Simmons. I, I think they can add to the roster in other places to create that run differential. That's what you're trying to get at the end of the day. You're trying to get the best run differential because that gives you the highest Pythagorean win-loss probability. So I think the Yankees, if they fail to get a good shortstop offensively, they'll go for a really strong defensive shortstop. They'll go for either Falefa or Simmons. And then they'll try and use one of their prospects. You know, it's probably going to cost you Peraza or Dominguez, which I really don't want them to trade either one of those guys or Volpe for that matter. You go out and you get Matt Olson because you put him at first base He's going to hit 45 home runs at Yankee Stadium, almost guaranteed if he's healthy, and he can pick it. And then you do what you can to improve the roster in other areas. Maybe you go out and sign Chris Bryant to play third base. You know, here was one thought that I had that I thought the Yankees uh, should have, you know, should at least consider. Approach Carlos Correa, who's going to be 28 years old, and say, we'll make you the highest paid player in baseball history for one year. And then you get to be a free agent next year. Again, you're still in your 20s. You get to live your dream of being the Yankee shortstop. We'll give you one year, $45 million. You're the number one paid player in baseball. You're betting on yourself that you're going to have a great year. And, you know, then you let him play out the season. And then your younger guys, maybe you're ready. That's one way they could go. And that's uh, something I would, you know, consider if I were the Yankees. But, uh, you know, if they, if they fail to get a shortstop, they're just going to have to load up in other areas. They're going to have to get a pitcher. Carlos Rodon is still available. I think you're going to see them go after Brian Reynolds. If they actually make him available in Pittsburgh, he's a guy who's at the height of his tradeability because he's got control. He's an excellent ball player. He's in a position of need. And if you trade for Brian Reynolds, well, then you can afford to give up Jason Dominguez because Dominguez probably isn't going to be here for a couple of years. He's a center fielder, and presumably you can bring in Reynolds for – you know, five, six, seven years at least, you know, if you want to extend him. So I think they're also conscious of the Aaron Judge contract. Aaron Judge is going to get, a you know, probably 250 to $300 million contract. Do you want to pay for another $300 million contract if you know you're going to be signing Aaron Judge? Uh, it's just going to be an interesting, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see how things play out over the next, you know, few months. Yeah, certainly, certainly. And, uh, Yankees have a lot of different ways they can go. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the uh, the front office does. Uh, but kind of switching into the rumor side of things right now, talking about the uh, the players, you know, the Yankees are looking in at. Uh, there was a couple of rumors today uh, for center field. The Yankees were interested uh, in Kevin Kiermaier. Uh, they've reached base there. Nothing, nothing big. Like we said, but just kind of checking in. It looks like the uh, Rays do have Kiermaier locked up, though. I just saw something that the Rays were like closely in on Kiermaier. Yeah, yeah. The uh, well, Kiermaier. He, um, I think that they they are having some forty man roster issues, and they need to move somebody. And Kiermaier is somebody who they feel they could get some return for. Mm -hmm. Yankees are obviously interested, but those two guys, those two teams, are going to be going at it for the division for the next few years. Hard to see them making a trade with each other. And the uh -huh. yeah, while we're on that, the Rays they also traded Joey Wendell to the Marlins. So that's yep. some good news for the Yankees. He yeah, that's them a, decent a big help. He was certainly a Yankee killer. Yeah. Um, also, Freddie Freeman. Uh, there were some rumors today saying the Yankees were interested, but you know, team other teams find it hard to believe he would uh, leave Atlanta. But I believe it was reported. Uh, he only wanted uh, six years, one hundred eighty-five million, and that was a little confusing to uh, to Atlanta or fans are around baseball why that hasn't happened yet. So interesting to see uh, how that plays out. Uh, they've also looked at Trevor Story, notable guy, uh, and that's really. They also looked at Filippo, like Christian said earlier. Um, but those are basically all the the rumors. For now, and, is uh, there anyone, uh, Derek, that you yeah. really have your like heart set on that you really want to be a Yankee this upcoming season? Um, of that group, not really. Uh, I, I'm not a Trevor Story guy. I mean, he, he's another 250 hitter. He's a good defender, but if you look at his splits away from Colorado, they're not great. And traditionally, you know, guys even out a little bit when they leave Colorado. 
but to me, he's another guy that's going to want a seven, eight year deal. And I just don't, I don't want any part of another big right-handed bat who's not going to hit for average for the next seven, eight years. I think we've learned over the last couple of years that, you know, making contact matters a little bit. I, you know, if, if there was anybody at the top of my list, it would be Matt Olson. Um, you know, I think the, the package I'd be willing to trade the most for would be Brian Reynolds. Oh, my, my cat's hopping up to say hello there. Uh, but, uh, but if there was one guy who I think would benefit the most from being on the Yankees and, and, uh, Joe, but get out, get out of the shot here. You're killing my light. Um, one guy who would benefit the most from being on the Yankees, it would be Matt Olson. I, I just think you put Olson in between Aaron Judge and John Carlos Stanton, and you got three freaking Tyrannosaurus Rexes in a row that you got to get. I mean, imagine, imagine bases loaded, nobody up, nobody out at one point during the game, and it's a one run game, and you got to go through Judge Stanton or Judge Olson Stanton. I mean, come on, that's going to wear any pitcher out. That's the guy I want. Mm-hmm. I yeah. Agree. Uh, one I thing about Trevor's I story. I just, I'm not dead set on story. If you were to tell me going into this who I want, it'd be Seager. But uh, story, he can play center field. However, he's going to get something more than bias, his contract. And I don't know if you want to do that. Yeah. So. Yeah, I just don't think it's a great move. I mean, the Yankees are in a rock, or in between a rock and a hard place. You know, they bet on... Glaber Torres being able to play shortstop and he wasn't able to do it. Mm-hmm. So, you know, now you're going to have to ante up for another big contract or you're going to have to move some people. I could see the Yankees making a trade to move some of their bigger contracts. I know that people are going to shoot this down and people are going to say it's, you know, never happened. I could see the Yankees trading John Carlos Stanton to the Los Angeles Dodgers uh, because, one, the Dodgers are going to have a uh, DH next year. Uh, There'll be a National League DH. The Dodgers just lost a significant bat. They're going to want to add some excitement. John Carlos, a California guy. John Carlos coming off of a great season. The Yankees, he's have him on a fairly team friendly contract with six years, I think, left at twenty-two million per year as a AAV for them. I could see them unloading him. And then using that uh, roster spot and that money to go out and get a couple more athletic players that are a little bit younger. Me and Ryan, uh, it's funny you say that. We were on FaceTime last night. We were planning the thing. And I told him, we got to get rid of Stan. And he said he's trading with the Dodgers. The Dodgers mm-hmm. are the one team that would really want him. He just came off a good season. And we've seen Stan and when he's bad. When he's bad, he's really bad. So if he gets to that form in a few years, no one's going to want him. So you may as well trade him while he has value now. Uh-huh. But, uh, and he uh, has the no trade clause, I believe, so he yes. would have to uh, waive that to, uh, to have that trade go through. But if you could entice him, you know, I, I believe he grew up a Dodger fan. If you can entice him, you know, say, look, you know, playing for your favorite uh, hometown team. And, you know, you might be able to just get him to go to L.A. So it's certainly, I think, something the Yankees should uh, check out. Yeah, I agree. I, look, I like what John Carlo did for the Yankees this year. I, I'm not doubting that he can do it again. And I think he's going to benefit from the Eric Cressy, you know, uh, sports performance lab that they've got there in the new program. He was moving well in the outfield, you know, but – you know, he, he, he can't run to first base anymore, right? I mean, he did have a calf injury. At some point, he's going to break down in the next couple of years. Dodgers probably know that. But he's a guy that, you know, he could hit you 45 home runs next year like that at a discount. Um, so, you know, and maybe the Yankees would even be willing to uh, make some kind of a Stanton-Bellinger swap. You know, Bellinger is a guy that I think that, the Dodgers would be willing to move and he's a left-handed bat. He can play first base. He can play center field. It's a weird combination. Uh, but, uh, I would love to see that. That would definitely be interesting. Bellinger, Stanton, both wild cards, I would say. Uh, and Stanton's also a guy. Blockbuster deal. Yeah. Yeah. I think both fan bases would be a little upset about that. uh, Yeah. Yeah. Maybe excited. I don't know. Bellinger's dad played for the Yankees, I believe, so 
Clay Bellinger. Yeah, he was a member yeah. of the World Series championship teams. He was a really reliable player. He wasn't like his dad. He wasn't like a big home run guy. He was more of like a uh, – I'd put him up there with like a, you know, a Gio Urshela type almost. Mm -hmm. Good good defender, right-handed hitter, you know, occasional pop. But, his, you know, Cody Bellinger is just a monster when he uh, – when yeah. He's the bat well. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Certainly. If you want to shift things in now to our next topic, is center field. Um, and there, what would you do at center field if you're the Yankees? You're obviously got Aaron Hicks uh, played winter ball. Uh, he's playing winter ball now. He uh, we've seen some of the highlights. Um, I mean, he looks pretty good, but it, it's pretty early. So, and he's well, coming up. It, it, it's winter ball. I mean, he's playing against minor leaguers, basically. You know, um, I want to see it for four or five months in a row, you know, in the big leagues. I, I just don't think Aaron Hicks can stay healthy. I think signing him to that big contract was a mistake from day one. What happens sometimes in the major leagues is if a guy is approaching his arbitration years, right? He's at a, you know, fork in the road contract wise, and he has a kid which is something that Aaron Hicks did. He had a kid. Uh, the team will take advantage of that by giving him a contract that offers him some security, like a longer deal at a lower annual rate. So they were able to get him seven for 70, 10 million bucks a year is not a bad deal in, in this day's game uh, if he stays on the field. But the problem for the Yankees is he just hasn't been able to stay on the field. So I, I think the Yankees are planning to run Aaron Hicks back out there. Personally, I would try and trade for any center fielder I could I could get. I like Cedric Mullins, too, if you can't get Ryan Reynolds. Mullins, obviously, is a uh, Oriole, and it's rare for the Orioles and Yankees to make deals. The owner of the Orioles doesn't like the Yankees, so it's, it's quite rare that that happens. A couple years ago, uh, I remember that they had to kind of overpay a little bit to get Zach Britton. And uh, ended up trading Dylan Tate, who was a top pick uh, they got for Beltran. So, um, I mean, one of those two guys, Brian Reynolds or Cedric Mullins, would be my go-to. But, you know, I would also consider, uh, you know, putting one of the younger guys out there, like Estevan Floreal. I mean, I get his offensive numbers were not good, but he's a great defender, and I think he'll stay on the field at least. And you never know what he might do in Yankee Stadium. Big, strong guy, hits left-handed. You know, nobody expected Adolis Garcia last year with the Rangers to have the year he had. I think he hit 31 home runs. He was a guy who was designated for assignment before the season. Any team could have had him, right? Sometimes guys just put it together. And I think Estevan Floreal, just watching him play, he's athletic enough, he's strong enough, and his baseball skills look good enough. Like, he's got a good swing. He takes close pitches. He's got um, a lot of speed. Like, he looks like a guy who – if he just happens to put it together, could be a really good player. Yeah, I was yeah. watching him. I went to one of his games when he was in the minors. I was there for a baseball tournament. He went two for two with two home runs. Hmm. He's got – he's something. He's a, he's a he's beast, something. man. I, he, he can run down anything. Too. He reminds me of Bernie Williams the way he runs. I mean, you guys are probably too young to remember Bernie, but Bernie was just so smooth out there. You didn't see him dive for balls a lot. Uh, because he was standing under it, he would just basically outrun the ball. He was the he was just so good, and that's what Estevan Florial reminds me of. Yeah. yeah, funny you say Bernie Williams. I'm wearing his uh, shirt right now. Nice, nice. Yeah. Bernie, I'm a big Bernie fan. I think he gets kind of gypped a little bit because he was so like he was such a big part of that dynasty, and it gets labeled the co core four when it really should be like you know core five, Fab Five, whatever you want to call it. Because that dynasty doesn't happen without Bernie Williams. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of different ways uh, they could go for uh, center field. Uh, some ways look tough, like especially if you want to go out, get a Reynolds or a Mullins. Uh, looks like you have to trade a lot, especially if you want to bring in a guy like Olsen. You know, that could potentially uh, hinder what you do in center field if you want to make a trade trade like that so uh right. christian any any other things on center field uh well first while you're on the orioles i'll let you do the announcement i know it's your guy so 
Yeah, well, breaking news today to the Orioles. One of my fan favorites of last season, Rudnett Odor. Uh, oh, man. Went to the Orioles. Uh, I was a big Ruggy guy. Um, I always liked him, especially when he punched Bautista. That's really when I became a fan of him when he was in Texas because I hated Bautista as a Yankee fan. So, But, you know, good luck to him in Baltimore. Uh, should get a lot of playing time. And Can't hear you. Oh. Uh, can you hear me? Can't hear any of us. All right, give us a minute. Okay. Hang on. My audio cut out. You good now? You can hear it, like, ringing. All right, I can hear you now. Sorry, you my, uh, my my headphones disconnected. They connected to the other computer. All right, we That's were awesome. just talking about Ruge. Um Yeah, yeah. Ru- Rugnet Odor. Yeah, if you want to start that over, go ahead. Well, no, I basically said everything, but, yeah, Rugo was my guy. Uh, sad to see him go, but, you know, that's the one. Yeah. I hated Rugnet Odor, man. I, wow. I, I, I liked I, – look, I'll give Rugnet this. He improved over the course of the season. Like, he got better. Like, when he first got to the Yankees, um, he didn't ever hit the ball the opposite way. Like, he, yeah. he always tried to pull the ball. And as the season went along – he was using that wide open left side more, which I liked, but he just swung and missed too much. Same reason also, I'm not a big uh, Joey Gallo fan. I just I'm so tired of swings and misses. It's just so boring. Yeah, the thing with me that I really loved about Ruby is the Yankees, like last few years especially, have lacked energy in the dugout, the clubhouse, yeah. and it, it seemed like every time something happened in the game for the Yankees, uh, Ruby would just be out of the dugout, you know, cheering on his team. I really liked that about him. You know, he knew he was in the star of the team, best player, but, you know, he gave it his all, and, and uh, he was always there to support his teammates, which I really loved about I also, him. Uh, I also couldn't stand Ruggie. However, I do think the Yankees set him up to fail. I mean, you're having a second, a short second baseman play third base that you can't just switch positions. Yeah, that was not fair to him. Uh, credit to Rugnet Odor, though, for... You know, taking it. that role on, agreeing to play third. You know, he could have simply said, "No, I can't." You know, I can't do it. I'm going to hurt my value. Uh, but he he went over there and and just uh, you know played his heart out. But look, the Yankees need more guys who can put the ball in play. They just need to strike out less. I mean, there's something to hitting the ball where they ain't, and the Yankees just don't do that enough. Yeah, yeah. Going into our final segment now if we uh, want to the fun one we'll start off with you Derek what are the top three Yankee games you've ever been to top three I've ever been to um all right so I went to one um in 1996 ALCS game one uh Bernie actually walked it off it was the Jeffrey Mayer game uh Jeter hit a home run uh, just Yankees won uh, against the Orioles. So that, that was an awesome game. I haven't been to a lot of – Yankees usually lose when I go. You know, uh-huh. I've only been to, you know, maybe a couple dozen games. Uh, I went to one um, – I want to say it was 1995 ALDS game one. That was Don Mattingly's first playoff game. First playoff game that the Yankees had had since 1981. And that was awesome just because of how loud it was. Like, the stadium, the city was so hungry for the Yankees to be back in the playoffs. There was all these diehard fans. I mean, I was way up in the upper deck. It was super loud. Wade Boggs hit a home run. Ruben Sierra hit a home run and danced to first base. I bumped into Joe DiMaggio after the game. Like, I was reading my program walking, and I just walked right into Joe DiMaggio. Um, And then I'd say... I went to a game. You guys probably remember this one. I, I want to say it was 2015. might have been 2016. July 3rd, Masahiro Tanaka is pitching against the Tampa Bay Rays. Mark Teixeira hits a big three-run home run to tie it in the eighth inning, kind of does one of these things where he's holding up the bat for a while. And then Brian McCann hits a home run to win it with the fireworks going off. That, I was at that game. That was awesome. I took That's my wife. Sweet. That was her first trip to Yankee Stadium. 
That's pretty yeah, awesome. Yeah, that, uh, that's a good list. Um, for my side, my top three favorite Yankee games that I've ever been to, probably number one, my only Yankee playoff game that I've been to, I was at 2017 uh, game three of the ALCS against the Astros. Uh, CC was on the mound. Uh, Frazier hit a home run early. Uh, I believe Judge went yard, and they kind of blew the Astros out. I believe they won nine to two or something like that. But that was like my first time in that atmosphere, in the atmosphere in the playoffs, and that place was going crazy. I, you know, like the CC chance. It was like an unbelievable experience. And then for number two, this was actually my first game that I ever went to uh, as a kid. I got rained out a bunch, and this is my first game. It was the game the Yankees broke the uh, Grand Slam record for the most oh. Grand Slam against the uh, Oakland A's. And then I remember at the uh, end of the game, they put Posada in at second base, which was really fun because he grew up in the minors as a second baseman. So that was really cool, and he fired it to Swisher at the end for to win it. Uh, and then number three, uh, although... The outcome of the game was not how I envisioned it. I was at uh, this past season's Yankees-Mets. Uh, it was the Sunday night baseball. The one Lindor hit three home runs. Oh, hit yeah. Lindor were chatting. It was just like, yeah, I was standing a bunch with, around Yankees and Mets fans. And, you know, Stan turns around, points at Lindor. They're screaming. The Mets fans are screaming. The Yankees fans are screaming. It was just like an awesome, awesome rivalry, although – didn't end how I wanted it to, but it was still a good game. Yeah. And Mets didn't yeah, playoffs. That was uh that that three Grand Slams game was fun. That's a good memory. I forgot all about that. The uh, Posada making that throw from second base it almost gave me a heart attack. That's yeah. a good one. Um, I'm not gonna do ones I've been to. I haven't been to enough good games. I'm gonna do my top three this year. Uh, okay. Number three. I had the Stanton Grand Slam against the Red Sox. I mean, that's, uh, you could say that. Uh, number two, I have Judge Walkoffs into the playoffs. Uh, pretty awesome. It was like everything, all the stress, all the blown games just finally relieved. But number one, and this was when the Yankees just felt unstoppable. It was the second game against the Braves. And we this was for the 10th game in the win streak, I think. And we're up like 4-2. We bring Chapman in. Obviously, he does his thing. He loads the bases, blah, blah, blah. So we have bases loaded. Uh, we're up 4-3. And Freddie Freeman's at the plate. So we take out Chapman, and we put in Wandy Peralta. And Wandy Peralta, he goes down 3-1 on the count. And he just keeps throwing strike after strike after strike. And Freeman keeps fouling off every ball. Every pitch, you're just you're waiting for the game to be over. He, gain, he brings it to a 3-2 count, and Freeman just hits it to the track. And uh, Gallo tracks it down for the win. Yeah, that, w- that was, was a good awesome. game. I, I wish there were more wins this year that we could reflect on. Yeah. It was just like it was. I felt like this year, even though they won ninety three games, they felt like an eighty win team. You know what I mean? Like a lot of their wins that they won, it felt like they had to try really hard to beat teams that they should have beaten pretty easily. And a lot of their wins came on things like wild pitches and just like yeah. weird stuff. Like you didn't smoke the other team enough. Like there weren't enough like nine to two wins or three Grand Slam game type things. Uh, we, you just can't run it back next year. They got they got to do something yeah. quick. I agree. 100%. Yeah, I mean that last season was just like the weirdest year uh, I've seen most, mostly in sports. I mean, I've told Christian this a lot. Like, I don't know any other team out of like the four major sports that was just like this inconsistent. Like, I just and I think even the front office was baffled. Like, it it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. How you could win like third games in a row and then lose seven in a row and it's just like a constant up and down streak throughout the season and it was just yeah, and it was it crazy. Would be all the but, players i mean it would be like the lineup's cruising and then no one can hit it, it, it wouldn't make sense it's just a bad baseball team double guys. plays <laughs> i don't yeah. uh we're hoping right, for well, change I, next year 
That's why but, we get a little concerned when uh we're, we haven't made any moves yet. Well, like you know, like I said before, it's 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 about halfway through the journey. I mean, we're gonna have this entire lockout period. Teams can talk to each other. They can talk about trades and things like that. So you know, if the Yankees don't sign anybody, they might make some trades later on. But I don't think they're gonna run back the same team. I I do think they have a plan. Yeah. 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 I, I, I certainly hope so. Yeah. But, you know, we got to have faith in the front office that they know what they're doing. Yeah. All right. Uh, it was a great episode, Derek. Uh, we were super stoked to have you on here. Uh, can't wait till you know, the season is starting up and we get to see, you know, you uh, on NYY Recaps talked about the Yankees. Uh, we'll be doing the same thing over here. But, yeah, awesome episode. Uh, we we're super glad to have you on. Uh, Christian, any anything else you'd like to add? Thanks for coming. This was awesome. I appreciate it, guys. I had a good time. This is my first time doing one of these in a while. I had really? to rebuild my my podcast studio, and so I just I haven't done a live stream since the last day of the season. Uh-huh. I've been kind I've been kind of just under the radar, and it's kind it's been kind of fun getting my energy back. So looking forward to getting back into it. Nice. All right. Nice. All right, yeah. guys. Take care. All right. Thank you for coming on. And. That was the MYY recaps. Derek coming on here. Hopefully he gave you guys a great other side of baseball. You know, it's nice to hear what other people, you know, uh, I don't want to say around the business, but, you know. Other fans, you know, other big names, what they think. Yeah, exactly. You know, their takes, because especially, you know, baseball and stuff like that, it's very you got to use your mind a lot. And all of these other people have their different opinions on what they want the Yankees to do. And it's good to talk about them because the more you talk about it, the clearer you can see and in your mind envision the team. Um, anything other? Anything else, Christian? No, I think this was a pretty awesome episode. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe. Last episode, I said make it the most liked video. You didn't. Only yeah. got eight likes. So, yeah. this episode, 15 likes. 15 likes, and we're doing a giveaway. All right? Uh, that's all I got. Wow. Ryan, whenever you are ready. By the way, we have the normal intro coming back. Per the fans. Yeah. Voted for it. You guys obviously wanted the old intro, uh, and we'll keep it. We probably, maybe for Christmas, make like the new cut scenes, but uh, the song will definitely stay the same. So quick things uh, for the giveaway. Uh, we could give away a Gary Sanchez jersey. We could give away a Jacoby Ellsbury jersey. Yeah. No one wants that. Um. As a, I have a Yankees sleeping bag if anyone wants a used Yankees blanket. So we got some stuff. Uh, yeah. Could also give away yeah. money. You never know. Uh, Ryan, do the outro. Well, I, I, I had to add one more thing. Now it's just kind of like, ah! All right. Anyway, quick last thing. Um, lockout is approaching. You guys are like, oh, no, I don't have my Yankees do. Guess what? Guess what? Just because there probably won't be that much news, everything won't be frozen, you know, uh, you'll probably be like, well, you probably forgot about baseball. You know, this is, uh, you can thank Manfred, the owners, and the players for this. Um, but, yeah, I mean, stay tuned. We've got a lot of fun things. Our dogs are going to host a podcast, Ruby and Duke. Uh, it's going to be epic. Uh, Ruby knows a lot about baseball, you know, Christian, if you want to, Tell the fans on, you know, that Ruby was actually a former big leaguer uh, back in the day. So maybe Christian will tell you that story. She doesn't know Uh, much. Don't expect much. Yeah. Yeah. All right. As always, Bronx Talks, it's been fun. Keep talking.